Hey everyone, I'm Nick, and welcome to another episode of Advanced Topics. So in this episode of the series, we're going to be talking about hardware memory barriers. So in the past, we've talked about software memory barriers and how we can use these to prevent the compiler from reordering our memory operations in our executables. Now, even if we get these memory operations in our binaries in the order we want, this doesn't guarantee that they are going to become globally visible in that same order at runtime. So depending on what operations we're talking about in the memory model of a processor, we might see these memory operations become globally visible out of program order. And to prevent this, if, if we need to, we can use hardware memory barriers. So to understand this a little bit better, um, we have to take a look at uh, the microarchitecture of our processor. We can use this to give us a, a bit more of an intuitive um, view of how this how this reordering can happen. And specifically, we're going to be focusing on uh, the memory subsystem, and in particular, uh, the store buffer that's within the memory subsystem. Now, our store buffer is here uh, as an optimization, and it does exactly what it says it does. It's a store buffer. It's there to buffer stores. The idea behind it is that loads are on the critical path. So if we're loading data, um, we have instructions that are going to use that data. We don't want to be holding them up. So we want to prioritize loads over stores. So what we can do is we can buffer our stores in a store buffer, uh, giving priority and bus bandwidth to our loads, and then our stores can drain out as bus bandwidth becomes available. Right? And that's the idea behind a store buffer. Now, the reordering uh, that we can see between stores and loads um, can also be the result of having a store buffer here. And this reordering can even happen in an in-order processor, so it's not reliant on having out-of-order execution. Um, so for example, let's say that in, inside of our program, we have a store followed by a load. Now what can happen, even in an in-order processor, is that the store can execute and go into our store buffer. So it's being buffered there. It hasn't become globally visible yet. Then after the store is becoming buffered, we can have a load occur and um, go all the way to our L1 data cache, right? And it becomes globally visible at that point. Then at some point afterward, that store that we had uh, can drain out of our store buffer, goes to our L1 data cache and becomes globally visible. So what we've had happen here, even in an in-order processor, um, despite the fact in our program order says that we have a store and then a load, in terms of global visibility, it looks like we had a load and then a store, right? These operations became globally visible out of program order. Now, to get more of the specifics about what kind of reordering is allowed, what kind of reordering is not allowed, um, we have to take a look at the software developer manual for our processor. Now, unfortunately for us, um, this is about 5,000 pages um, altogether, um, but fortunately, or somewhat fortunately, we can really just focus on this section 8.2 which specifically talks about memory ordering. Right? And we can kind of skim through it and pick out the parts we need. So um, memory ordering, so if we just take a look at this first paragraph, it refers to the order in which the processor issues, reads, and writes through the system bus to system memory. Right? And it, it talks about kind of the most basic form of, of memory ordering model that we can have called uh, program ordering or strong ordering. Uh, which is the intuitive ways that we typically the intuitive way that we typically reason about our programs. So the idea that reads and writes are issued on the system bus and the order they occur in the instruction stream under all circumstances. So the idea is if I have something like a read and then a write in my program on the system bus, I'll always see the read before the write. And likewise, if I have a write and then a read, I'll always see the write before I see the read on the system bus. Now, if we take a look at the second paragraph, that's where things like the store buffer kind of come in. So to allow performance optimization of instruction execution, we see that the um, IE32 architecture um, has a departure from this idea of strong ordering uh, called processor ordering. And this exists on the Pentium 4, Xeon, and P6 processor family. So if you have a modern x86 processor, um, it'll have, you'll, you'll be under this processor ordering uh, memory model. So, um, we can see here it allows the performance enhancing operations such as allowing reads to go ahead of buffered writes, right? So that's this idea of the store buffer 
that we were talking about right with our microarchitecture. We can have a store that's buffered inside of our store store buffer, and then a load can bypass it, right? It can, it can go past it, even though it's out of program order. Okay, um, now to, to look at this a little bit more, we can see kind of a list of all the rules that we have inside of our x86 processor with respect to this memory model. Uh, and, and we see that it, it's rather strict in a number of ways, right? We see that um, reads are not reordered with the reads. So if I have a read one and then read two, read one will always occur before read two. Um, likewise, uh, writes are not reordered with older reads. So if I have a read and then a write, the read will go out on the system bus always before the write. Um, we have um, writes with other writes or are not reordered with other writes. So if I have write to location one and then a write to location two, the write to location one will occur and go out over the system bus before the write to location two. And there are some exceptions to this. So it says things like streaming stores and non-temporal move instructions and string operations. We're not going to worry about that here. Common case, um, writes are not reordered um, with respect to each other. Um, we also have some stuff about these cache line flush operations. We'll skip that for now. Um, and then we hit basically the point that we're most concerned with here. Reads may be reordered with older writes to different locations, but not ones to the same location. Right, so basically not if we have a dependency um, between these two instructions. So it's saying if I have a write to A and then a read to B, in terms of global visibility, I might see the read to location B before the write to A. Uh, now, as another very nice thing in the software developer manual, it has these little litmus tests um, that, that tries to explain these different kinds of reorderings and what's allowed and not allowed um, with these very simple examples here. And the one we're going to be testing out today and looking at some code for relates to um, the reordering case. So the loads may be reordered with earlier stores to different locations, right? So to understand how this can be kind of non-intuitive, um, let, let's just take a look at this little litmus test. So the idea here is that we have two threads going, one on processor zero, one on processor one. Processor zero is writing one to X and then reading y into R1, and then processor one is writing one to y, and then reading x into R2, right? So we have that situation where each thread is uh, writing to one location and then reading from another location here. And the idea is that um, initially x and y are both zero. So what are the potential values that we could be reading into R1 and R2? So very simple case. Both the writes could occur, right? So we could store one to X, then store one to Y, and then processor zero reads Y and processor one reads X. So we could see R1 and R2 are both equal to one. That's one potential uh, combination of values we can see. Um, another thing can occur is that processor zero could do both of its instructions. And then processor one does both of its instructions. So we write one to X and then we read Y and then processor one writes one to Y and then reads X. So we could see um, as final values for R1 and R2, we could see one zero or zero one, right? That's perfectly valid. Now the non-intuitive part comes from the fact that a possible combination of values that we can see here for R1 and R2 is zero and zero. This is perfectly valid in modern x86 processors, where the idea here is we store one to X here, but it doesn't become globally visible. It goes into our store buffer. Then we store one to Y here, but it doesn't become globally visible yet. It goes into our store buffer. Then this read can occur and become globally visible. So we read zero while this store to Y is still being buffered. And then we can read X here, right? Which is still zero because this write to X is still being buffered. It hasn't become globally visible yet. So basically, it's as if both of these reads were moved up ahead of both of these writes. Right? That's the situation we're talking about in the reordering that can occur. And this isn't necessarily a bad thing. This can be a, a, a good thing in terms of performance. It can become a bad thing if we're relying on the ordering of these writes and reads for a particular reason. And there are situations where we do rely on this ordering of 
writes and reads to different locations. Um, okay, so, so that's a bit of a background, and that's what we're going to be testing today. We're going to be implementing this litmus test. Uh, now, there's a great blog that talks about this, um, which I'll, I'll link below the video. And basically, we're going to be recreating um, this benchmark to show exactly this litmus test, but with a few more um, C++ um, 20 uh, type features like C++ semaphores and C++ threads. Um, okay, so, so let's look at the reordering case first. So we'll kind of shrink this over and we'll first open up this software barrier.cpp. Um, and it's all going to be about this reorder function here, which is re-implementing our litmus test. So um, we're going to spawn two threads that are both going to run this reorder function, and we're going to um, do this forever. We're just going to keep going and going and going. So each thread is going to wait for basically a signal to start, and we'll go ahead and use a semaphore for this. And then we're going to have that situation where we're writing to one location. So we're writing to V1, say 1. We have a software barrier that prevents the compiler from reordering these operations. So we know that they're going to be in the correct order and they're executable. And then we read from the opposite location. So we write to V1 and then we read from V2 here. Right? And then we, sit, we, we tell the main thread that we're done. Right? Now inside of our main thread, we're going to set everything initially to zero. We're going to spawn our two threads, T1 and T2, right? And we're going to reverse V1 and V2 for each one. So um, thread one is going to use V1 and V2, and then thread two will use them in the opposite order, V2 and V1, right? So this is our, um, our right to X read from Y and our uh, right to Y read from X, right? That's what these two threads are doing. And then we're going to have an infinite for loop here. So we're going to test this over and over and over. We're going to reset every iteration, setting these both to zero. We're going to tell both of our threads to start. We're going to wait for them to finish. And then we're going to check to see if a reordering occurred. We're going to check to see if R1 and R2 were both equal to zero here, right? So that's what's going on here. We're checking to see if both of our reads got moved above both of our writes to V1. So that's exactly what we're going to be measuring here. If we see that that's true, we'll go ahead and just print it out and uh, we'll, we'll kill the program with an assert. Otherwise, we'll print out what the resulting values were. Okay, so we'll go ahead and quit out of here and we'll compile this software memory barriers.cpp and we'll go ahead and run it. And what we see is eventually we hit this false, we hit this assert. We see that we get different results, right? Sometimes we see one zero for R1 and R2, sometimes we see zero one. Um, perhaps infrequently we see one one, right? This requires these two threads to both do the writes and then both do the reads, right? Which requires very precise timing for that to happen. In most cases, we see either zero one or one one or, or, or one zero. Um, but we see that eventually we hit, the, we hit the case where both of our writes got moved after both of our reads, right? So we have this R1 equals zero and R2 equals zero case. And if we run this multiple times, we see that um, it can occur in different spots. So this one occurred on iteration 415. This one occurred on iteration 2585. This one occurred on iteration 4773, right? And you see we tried over and over. It can occur in, in different spots because this is completely a timing-based thing. It's not guaranteed to happen, um, which makes these kinds of bugs very difficult to, uh, to debug. Um, okay, so, so we know our problem. How do we get around this? How do we get around the fact that inside of our hardware, in silicon, we're having reordering of these, um, of these writes um, with later reads? Um, okay, that's gonna bring us to the point of these hardware memory barriers. Um, and specifically, we're going to be using this intrinsic called MM uh, Infants. So if we go ahead and read the description for this, it says it performs a serializing operation on all load from memory and store to memory instructions that were issued prior to this instruction. And what it guarantees is that every memory access that proceeds in program order, the memory fence instruction is globally visible before any memory instruction that follows the fence in program order. So what we're relying on here is not just talking about reads, not just talking about writes. We want to serialize both reads and writes here. We want 
all memory operations, so are stored to complete and become globally visible before a later load can go ahead, proceed and become globally visible. And what this entails is basically we need to make sure that our store buffer drains so we no longer have anything left in our store buffer. Everything is flushed out and become globally visible before uh, the next load can go out and become globally visible here. So we need this infants instruction to actually, uh, in our instruction stream, um, to make sure that this reordering can't occur. All right, so that's the hardware memory barrier that we're going to use. And that's what we'll go ahead and see here in our hardware memory barrier.cpp. So you, you can see here that our reorder function is, is basically exactly the same, right? We have um, you know this while loop. We wait for the uh, on the sim4 you know for the signal to start. We write to v1, but now we have this intrinsic that's this infants, right? This is going to prevent the reordering in hardware by making sure that that store buffer drains before any uh, preceding memory operation, uh, specifically loads, can uh, can go past it. So we have our infants. Then we have our read of v2. So we're making sure that our write to v1 is always globally visible before this read to v2 can occur. And that's what we're going to be doing over and over. Uh, the rest of our code inside of our main function is exactly the same. And if we ever see this reorder, right, we'll go ahead and assert. OK, so we'll go ahead and uh, compile this now. Uh, exact same optimization flag, so just O3 optimization. And then we can go ahead and run this. And, and what we see is that um, we never hit the assert, right? We'll run this over and over and over again. We see that uh, occasionally we're getting different ordering. So we're seeing lots of O1s. We see R1 equals 1, R2 equals zeros. Uh, occasionally, we'll see patches where we see R1 equals 1 and R2 equals 1. But we never hit the case where both the reads um, moved up um, before both of the writes, right? That ordering, a reordering of writes with later reads never occurs anymore, right? And if we go ahead and look in the actual um, uh, instructions inside of a program, so I'll use perf record and then uh, let it run for a little bit, and then we'll run perf report. We can go ahead and go to our reorder function, and we can see exactly what we have in our program right here. So we have this move that's going to be our store. So we're storing one to V1 here, right? this memory location. Then we have our infants that make sure that these preceding memory operations become globally visible. Then we have our read right after our memfins, or right after our memfins in instruction. So we're making sure that our write is become globally visible before our read instruction can occur. Okay, so, so that's a, a very basic use of this infants instruction and how it can be used to prevent this memory ordering. In the next video, we'll look at a practical example where we actually need to use um, uh, this infants instruction to get a, a functionally correct result, right? Um, now, again, as a, as a bit of a you know, caveat and clarification, a lot of times we do want this reordering, right? It's there for performance. There just are certain circumstances where we need to make sure that pre preceding writes are globally visible before later reads. Uh, but that's going to go ahead and do it for this episode. As always, you can check out any of this code on my GitHub page at github.com slash coffee before arch. So you can find this under repositories and then under miscellaneous code. And we have this, um, hardware barrier um, right here, hardware barriers. And so you see the software barrier and the hardware barrier example. And the next time we'll be looking at Peterson's algorithm for mutual exclusion that actually requires us um, uh, to use this infants instruction um, in order to implement it. But that's going to go ahead and do it for this video. As always, I'm Nick, and I hope you have a nice day.